Welcome or welcome back, everyone. This is our third and final session of our uh, farm labor research series, and we are thrilled. We're going to go back uh, today back into the research side of things, and we're going to hear uh, from, from two different sets of research. So first we have uh, Rachel Armstrong from Farm Commons and Jennifer Hashley who's joining us from, from Tufts and they have been working for, um, well, it feels like forever, but I think it's really only been a couple of years on a SARE project that's um, I have been lucky enough to be part of. So uh, they're gonna share a little bit about what's going on there. And then we're gonna hear from um, one of our team members, Kathleen Liang, who's gonna talk a little bit about labor and farming challenges in um, North Carolina. So uh, our recording is running. I um, We've got the link in there for live streaming if anybody would like to take advantage of that. And I guess I will turn it over to Rachel and Jennifer. All right, I will uh, take it away to start and then Jennifer will follow up after me. Okay. I'm sharing um, a picture of my slides. So are those coming up on your screen? They are. Okay, great. I'm with Farm Commons. Um, yeah, this is the, this is the presentation we're at. So start with a little bit of prefatory material. So Farm Commons, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Our goal is to empower the agricultural community to resolve legal vulnerabilities within an ecosystem of support. How do we do that? Well, we do a few different things. We have an extensive library of farm law education materials. They used to be PDF, but as of March 1, we have loaded all of those into a brand new website so you can um, browse them and, and all of our farm law education stuff. We also do workshops. We host workshops for producers nationwide on farm law risks and how to resolve them. Um, and we also have a workshop series for agriculture support persons on the same, how to uh, foster legal resilience in your agricultural community. Now, relevant to this project, the third thing we do is facilitate community-based and non-legislative solutions to complex farm law problems. It's not that we're opposed to legislative solutions, it's just non-legislative ones are the ones that you know, we can have a significant impact on in the near term without waiting on others. Um, we're especially keen on community-based solutions um, and making sure that we really understand what the farm community wants and where they find solutions to, to their problems. We're funded by grants, donations, and now by membership fees. Now myself, so um, I grew up in Northern Minnesota's agricultural community. That's where I am joining you today. There's a nice five to eight inches of fresh white snow on the ground as of last night. So we like to hold on to that winter for a long time. Um, I'm the executive director today. I founded the organ, well, I guess I always have been. I founded the organization back in 2012. This was the reason that I went to law school and it is a joy and a pleasure to be able to um, share uh, share these solutions with you and help, um, help us all discuss how farm law impacts our options um, for creating resilience. So this project is really based, of course, out of problems. It, uh, how can we find solutions to the problems experienced by farmers? And on my next, my next slide, we'll, we'll outline some of the problems experienced by farm workers. These are things we all really have a sense of. We don't even need studies to tell us. Farmers have problems recruiting the right help. And in some cases, any help at all. Uh, labor shortages are a chronic issue. Um, they're made worse um, by changing administrations, um, you know, fluctuations in, in um, economic circumstances. And to say nothing of the pandemic, which has been a whole nother can of worms for people to figure out. Farmers experience insufficient managerial pipeline. You know, they're not, they're not getting people that they can move up through the ranks sufficiently. High turnover. Um, alternative labor solutions like H-2A programs uh, can be difficult to access and have other concerns with them. So, and that's just, you know, a, a slight look at some of the problems experienced by farmers. When we get to those experienced by farm workers, well, there's the obvious low pay, no benefits. The work can be in, inconsistent, uh, not just in a season, but um, whether it occurs year round, whether it comes back year to year. 
Uh, farmer, farm workers can have an unclear, unclear career path and trajectory. How do they use farm work to learn about farming and then become a farm owner if that is their goal? If it's not their goal, if they'd really rather assume a management role, what's the career path to that? It can be difficult to follow that. Uh, farm workers also uh, cite variable quality of management on individual farms. Some farm Owners have really good managerial skills, others do not, um, can be difficult to navigate that. So what do we do about this? There's a number of different solutions that are out there that people are talking about. And, you know, we, we decided to test one of these. <laughs> Is there a solution to be had in pooling labor? And, you know, there's a number of different things you could call it, but the, the, uh, the word pooling um, has kind of stuck with us because what we're talking about is trying to combine forces uh, of farm workers for a few different purposes here. This pooling can take a few different shapes and sizes. Number one, let's say that workers could come together to pool their availability and then they could collectively sell their services to farmers. So this could happen through a variety of different legal structures, but the bottom line is that it's workers working with workers to try to create a more viable um, employment resource that farmers would then turn to to solve their labor problems. Now, on the other hand, farmers could come together and they could create that shared labor pool. So they would form one entity themselves that would then hire all the workers they need collectively, and then they would dole them out to each individual farm operation that was a part of this entity. So very similar concept to workers pooling themselves and then doling themselves out, except we have a different type of person who's in charge. Farmers would benefit there from centralizing recruitment, management, administrative, and legal responsibilities. There's a third option. <laughs> uh, no group of people has to come together. We just need an entrepreneur. We could have a private independent business that hires laborers and then makes them available to farmers. This looks a lot like a temp agency. Well, that's what a temp agency does. It's a private independently owned business that makes work available to others. Is this a good idea? Are these viable ideas? How could they work? Well, you know, they do promise some solutions in cons in theory. Centralized management could be more efficient for everybody and provide better service. If we have multiple farms working together or available to retain workers, we could smooth out seasonality. Um, we could improve managerial potential by providing more consistent and cross farm work. And of course, easing our administrative duties and legal compliance. But that's a big what if. Um, does it actually provide these solutions? The devil's always in the details, of course. But for the purposes of our project, we are trying to draw some conclusions regarding the practical, legal, and financial feasibility of going down this path. We, there's, there's an amount of devils that we can save for the details later if we can establish that there is a baseline feasibility to this. And that's really the essence of this project. Feasibility also depends on receptiveness to these ideas. If we don't have that, it doesn't matter how legally feasible it is or how, how much the business model says we're gonna make money doing this. If folks are not attracted to the idea and don't perceive it as a solution, then it's probably dead in the water. So we need to figure out both of these things to, to discover if this is really an idea with legs. So I'll spare you the house. I'll just get right to the conclusions in terms of how could this uh, how could this function. What we've figured out thus far is that a business model, whether it is a worker-owned co-op, a farmer-owned co-op, or an independent business, is going to is going to farmers who participate would have to pay at least seventeen dollars per hour for the services provided by said labor pool. Now, even at farm businesses paying seventeen dollars per hour, wages would have to be at 11 to $13. Now that's not even the minimum wage in some states for farm labor. It's above minimum wage in others, but we have a lot of state variability nationwide. So 
that's um, that's an iffy situation there. Um, and this business model only assumes a half-time office coordinator for day-to-day -day operations. So it would have to rely fairly heavily on um, on oversight and um, and higher level duties from someone, um, you know, be that the 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 worker co-op, the former co-op, or the business owner. Legally, our, our legal obligations of cost of compliance would actually increase for having pooled labor. And in some cases, they would be significant. Uh, we would have to pay overtime to all farm workers for all hours worked over 40. All farms participating would have to comply with OSHA. All farms would need to pay into unemployment insurance. In some states, none of these are obligated right now. So that could be a, a significant impact. In other states, there may already be these obligations. Now, on a practical level, the success of this business model also depends on sourcing and supplying labor in related markets, like commercial landscaping. The way, the way that things have played out, the only way to actually become profitable is to, is to get outside the farm um, community to those that have um, a better labor source, a better labor pool, um, a higher skilled labor force that relates to farming. So something like commercial landscaping. Now, yeah, you know, appetite for that varies. Um, and so that's something we really need to consider. So quick conclusions here, the legal structure of the business doesn't seem to matter tremendously from the legal and financial perspective, whether it's a worker owned co-op, farmer owned or a private business. Um, the legal obligations are um, significant um, and are lending to the high costs of pooling labor. But the question still remains, can the business model solve enough problems experienced by farmers and farm workers to be worth the increased costs? So bottom line, we're not saving money by doing this. We're going to have more costs, but is it still worth it? And that's where the focus group comes in. Is there receptivity to these solutions? Are they perceived as solutions? And so that's where I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer to discuss where we've gotten so far with focus groups. And then we'll do questions. I think we we'll just save those for the end, Jennifer. Sounds good. OK. Thank you. All right. So. Let me share my screen. Okay. And oops, let me put it in slideshow view and then share. I think that's how I have to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't allow me to click on click on things very easily. Great. All right. Can you all see that now? No. Okay. And you're saw seeing it the first time. Yes, we saw it the first time. We're not seeing it now. Oh. All right. No, how do I get out of it? Sorry, I shouldn't have. Okay. All right. I'll go back and share normally without being in screen uh, slideshow view. All right. So I guess you'll look at it this way. That's okay. Sure. Okay, um, well, thank you. I'm Jennifer Ashley, having technical difficulties uh, with the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. And our mission really is to help improve local and regional food systems. We're a beginning farmer training program. Uh, we run an incubator program and provide a lot of business support services. So these are our program areas, farmer training. Um, we do business planning classes, uh, crop production courses, our incubator farm, and then we help farmers with marketing through our food hub. And we run a few national programs to help build capacity of other service providers who offer land-based training. So we've partnered with uh, Rachel and Farm Commons on a few different projects related to farm labor. And this particular project that we're talking about was funded by SARE. And for those of you who are probably all familiar with SARE, but um, this was a new um, kind of proposal area in their research portfolio. So they're calling it research for novel approaches. So this seemed like a great opportunity to put forward this project to do something a little bit innovative. And so thinking about establishing, you know, the creativity of these business models and whether it would be receptive to farmers as Rachel already introduced us to. So that was our goal. And because this is a research project, we had to have a hypothesis. And so I think Rachel already laid that out really well. And our goal was to really ask the farmers about these different business models and get their feedback um, about whether it would solve their problems or not. So we hosted in 2020, 
right as COVID was happening, of course, so that created some challenges, but we ended up um, pulling off six focus groups throughout New England. So we had um, University of Connecticut Extension, got their first one in at the NOFA Connecticut Conference. We offered one um, at the NOFA Massachusetts Conference and held another one virtually. University of Vermont Extension held two virtually as well. Um, and then Cornell also got um, one in before things closed down. So we were able to get six focus groups and then other partners I just wanted to mention that are part of the project as well that helped with outreach. Obviously Farm Commons who's helped pull all of this together and really built the models and the format for the focus groups and the facilitation guides and everything that have been useful in this process. But NOFA Vermont helped with outreach. UNH has been part of this group and Cooperative Development Institute. And we've had representatives from the Department of Labor who've been also participating and reflecting and, and providing support as we've been looking at the different legal aspects of the models and compliance issues. So now to the meat. Um, so some of our key findings, they fell into these broad categories, which I'm gonna go into in a little bit more detail on each. Um, and so I'll just go through them one by one, but um, administration and finances. We all, I think we kind of came into this thinking that the wage issue might be a really big deal breaker for folks, but I think what we found is, you know, a lot of people, as, as Rachel said, are already paying in the 11 to $13 an hour range. And you know, even proposing $17 an hour for farmers, I think a lot of them really kind of worried about, well, would this really pay a manager's salary? With all these administration costs, would there really even be room left over for that? And would it cover other expenses? Would there need to be a critical mass? Like where's the sweet spot to break even? And farmers across the region are already paying a pretty broad range of wages. So that didn't seem, to me to be a deal breaker from what we've been hearing, but it, it certainly is a concern um, for folks that wage costs are continuing to go up. And I think we, and it was kind of like a light bulb that went off with a lot of the producers in the room when they started to really add up and think about all the other administrative costs they're already paying, but beyond the wage that it didn't seem um, as much of a, a shock to the system. Um, in some of the early models, we proposed a startup membership fee um, and a minimum investment to be part of the you know, worker owned or farmer owned cooperative. And that didn't seem to be a huge barrier for folks. It was, it was maybe a concern for some, but people thought that they needed to have a skin in the game um, to be able to do that. And then people were a little um, concerned about potential board control and qualifications and the managerial, um, trying to find the right manager to manage this. Like who's gonna do the, play that role? How will they be paid? Are they gonna be stretched too thin between meeting the demands of all the farmers who want workers and making sure that they have the right workers involved and how can all of this be done with, with minimal overhead and you know, one person? I think a lot will ride on that person is, is what a lot of folks said. And then that person itself is gonna to have to have a lot of expertise in managing the schedules, understanding what the agricultural operations are, the seasonality of it, the specialized skills that would be needed and all those impacts that come with trying to manage a, a complex operation across a lot of different complex operations as farms often are. Some of the other issues um, were around the complexity. Um, I think a lot of folks felt like, um, and the time commitment that might be involved. So any of the cooperative type models that we propose would really rely on the members themselves to be part of the management and administration and oversight of these. And so folks already felt like, you know, they're already strapped to being farmers and running their businesses. Do they have time to be on a board or, you know, a member owner and come to meet leadership meetings and you know, have to do group process with other farms. Like, is that too much time and, and complexity? And then people were really concerned that, you know, are there even workers who would want to participate in these models? Like, where would these people come from? How would this group or this pool find them? And then where, you know, how far across the region would this um, be spread and still work? You know, a lot of farmers that, that we queried in one of our focus groups were like, well, I don't really know any other farmers I could collaborate with in my close proximity where we could actually share workers across farms. And so where would the, that geographical bound to make this kind of a model work live? And then, you know, a lot of folks, you know, constantly bring up, you know, do people really want to do farm work? You know, they end up getting a lot of college students who work in the summertime and then leave. And would these kids rather, you know, do a, you work at a coffee shop or an air conditioned, you know, museum or somewhere else? And do they, is there, are there really people to fill these roles? And then, Thinking about what is the role of, of ag tech? You know, are there other technology pieces? Like how do we really encourage people to try out um, this farm work? Those were some of the other conversations that came up. And then people worrying about wage competition. You know, there are other jobs um, like landscaping as Rachel just mentioned or other things that can really pay potentially more than this, this pool could offer. 
So thinking about are there other incentives to help with recruitment, um, you know, dividends, stock sharing, insurance, um, tiered wage structures, things like that that came up in conversations. Some other outcomes, you know, just people wondering how would these models be responsive to changing labor demands, you know, are, should there be groups of similar farms that all have similar you know, vegetable operations and harvesting operations, or do we need to make sure that this pool would serve diverse needs so that people are milking cows, you know, and there's a different schedule and, and time commitment from that versus harvesting fruit versus vegetables versus other types of, of agriculture work. So but do they need to be similar types of farms or more diverse to mix up the, the balancing labor needs so that not everybody who's doing similar things at one time needs all the same workers at one time. So. Some other ideas that came up, would there be floaters that maybe floated between farms to fill in gaps? Or what happens if a worker just really likes a particular farm? You know, would they wanna remain loyal to that farm and not move around um, to different farms? And then how do you balance all the different training needs of the workers across all of these different farms? Because everybody likes to do, you know, have people harvest this way or pack things that way or drive the tractor in this way. Um, and so making sure that these workers do come trained to remove that training burden from the farmers. And then folks were still concerned that even with a labor pool model, like we proposed that retention uh, would be a challenge. So how, how would these groups still incentivize and retain workers from season to season? Um, is this an opportunity for more career advancement to move up from a laborer to a manager? Or you know, would these um, pooled labor models provide more benefits to keep workers um, coming back from season to season? And others express concerns about maybe, you know, they really like building those relationships over the farm season and developing a shared culture among the workers um, and who they're working with. And so, you know, just some concerns if they have people coming in and out or temporary workers, or even maybe potential conflicts between permanent labor and, you know, labor they might use from a labor pool, you know, how do they balance that kind of culture across the farm? And then similarly, we've said before, you know, differences in skills and training needed across the farm, how does that get addressed? And then um, a couple other big issues that came up too are around equitable decision-making and conflicts of interest with the model itself um, and then worker justice issues. So within the models, you know, there could be potential for larger farms to dominate the organization and management of the structure. And like, how do these groups build trust among themselves and among the different farmers? That takes a lot of work itself. Um, you know, how do they divide the division of labor among the farms members? If there's a larger farm, would they want more labor hours and smaller, would smaller farms be kind of lost in the shuffle? Should there be affinity, you know, models that really just focus on small farms and then, you know, or a large farm, you know, pool come together and kind of not have a mix of, of sizes or potential for that kind of um, domination to happen. And then, you know, again, where are the geographical bounds for these kind of labor pools? And then how do you really ensure that everybody's adhering to similar requirements? How do we know that workers are, you know, not getting more overtime here or being asked to do other things there? And like, how do you set those kind of requirements and procedures among everybody? And then the worker justice issue is certainly uh, something that everybody cared about. I, I've been you know, really delighted that, that I feel like farmers really do care about, you know, being able to pay people a living wage. It's, it's come up again and again, you know, wanting to have, you know, quality work environment. Some folks felt like, you know, even if this worker pool would be available, housing is such a challenge, you know, how far are people going to drive to their farms? Sometimes, you know, even in their communities, it's not available. You know, what do you do if there's a, a, a disagreement or a grievance that needs to be resolved for on the worker side? Um, and then I think the temp agencies got a pretty bad rap in, in our focus group conversation. Um, they just felt like they have a reputation for exploitation of workers and you know they're set up as potentially for-profit business models and therefore inherently are trying to make money uh, from both sides. So that that definitely was a thumbs down in, in the group that I one of the groups that I facilitated, but um, so this is just sort of a summary of some responses um, to the different models that we talked about. Um, we've talked a little bit about some of these already, but with these farmer owned LLCs, people thought there was some time savings, maybe there'd be less administration and maybe as, an, as a farmer owned entity, there could be some potential income generation there if it was a good business model. But folks, again, a little bit concerned about decision making structures, um, how are they gonna hire somebody, um, a competent person to manage it and pay them. And then what's the balance between large and small members of the LLC? And similarly for the, the farmer owned labor cooperative, you know, if there was a shared core values and equitable voting structure, 
folks really um, could get into that, that kind of a model. But concerns were like how much time would be committed. Again, is the manager going to be competent? And you know, how do we deal with the power balance and governance issues? And for a worker-owned labor cooperative, um, you know, folks thought maybe that would be a better opportunity for workers to really be invested if they were the owners of their own you know, labor cooperative model. And it could, you know, generate new employment opportunities in communities where a worker-owned labor cooperative people might be attracted to that kind of a work work um, work setting, and maybe they could um, advocate for higher wages or set their own wages really, and um, you know benefit themselves as workers and have more agency in that process. But concerns again, farmers were like, well, who's going to really manage that? Who's going to come together and organize that? And then how do they? How does that entity deal with peak demand when everybody wants everybody at peak harvest time? And then you know, are there incentives for retention within a worker-owned labor model? And then the temp agency most, mo mostly felt like, oh, maybe it could fill last minute gaps. Maybe it's good for folks just kind of dipping their toe in the water. If you really don't like the person, you can easily fire them. There's no hard feelings. Um, and there's really no startup costs because if that already existed, then nobody's really investing um, in a business model or putting in, you know, skin in the game um, to form the, the organization. But a lot of concerns about abuse, exploitation, and again, what's what's the reaction or culture between temporary versus permanent workers? So overall impressions, some were in favor of these business models, some were not in favor, and some want more details. So um, really people generally liked the cooperative type of models and, and things like that. So that's kind of where we've been going um, with round two of the focus groups. And some of the recommendations that came out and the decisions that we made um, reviewing all of this feedback was we dropped the temp agency model and the new model that we're working on is really more of a hybridized worker owned and farmer owned cooperative model. And again, our, our goal in all of this is to basically deliver a potential model that spells out the business plan, financial protection, uh, projections and legal implications of the model and try to get it as close to what seems like a feasible solution that farmers would actually adopt in the end. So we've taken the first round of feedback and now we are um, definitely in the process of our second group of focus, uh, focus groups to kind of come back with what we heard and ask new questions. So our new process piece this round is really focused on these two primary questions, you know, would this model succeed or fail? Why or why not? And like, how do you feel about it? What's your gut reaction about, you know, working under this kind of model and why or why not? So basically the, the facilitation structure is we're introducing different aspects of the model where we have an external survey as the presentation is happening. We're asking them to rate different aspects of the survey. We have a just, you know, how do they feel about it? What would they do in this situation? And then we discuss and then we ask, you know, well, after this discussion, would you change your response? Like, did what you just heard influence your decision in any way or why not? And we're giving people an opportunity to revise their answers. So we're both collecting the, the discussion and the kind of qualitative aspects of what they're thinking about this model and the quantitative aspects through the survey. And so it's really about how they feel about it. There aren't any right or wrong answers. And, you know, I've done two of my focus groups and it's been kind of fun um, doing that. So. Just wanted to close with special appreciation for all of our partners that have been involved in this project to make it happen, um, especially to Farm Commons for doing all the background legwork and you know, business model development and facilitation and you know summary of the research that we're finding and, and doing all of that. So they've just been such a core partner in this and then all of our outreach and focus group partners um, with all of our extension partners and um, outreach partners to help get producers both farm workers and farm owners um, to the table so that we can collect this information. So thank you. And I hope we have some time for questions. Awesome. Um, yes, we've got time. I'll have you unshare your screen. Kathleen can put her slides up. And um, if there's any questions, we can take a couple now. And then we'll certainly have time at the end as well. Oops. Um, and I will just say while we're waiting for folks to ask a question that um, I did my focus groups too and I will just say that um, you know it's labor is such a pain point for farmers right now it is you know it's they're really really struggling with this issue and and like Jennifer I'm just I'm so heartened to see both 
how much the farmers care about their employees, how much they want to they want to pay livable wages, how much it pains them when they don't feel like they can do that. Um, but I'm also equally warmed at the the heart of the farm workers and the employees and how much they really care about the communities and the farmers and. Um, I just I feel like it's it's really important for us to figure this out and and offer some solutions. I'm also um, have become aware, although I didn't really need to to know this or to be reminded of this, but there's there is no one size fits all in terms of farmers. Farmers get into farming as individuals, and they're very individualistic in the way they see things and think about things. So there's no part of me that thinks we're going to crack this nut with one one solution. But I feel like there's going to we've got to collect a toolbox of solutions. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, but I'll give you folks a chance to, uh, you're welcome to add them into the um, the discussion, the chat box. And um, Kathleen, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Are you looking at my slides okay? I, I see your slide just fine, yes. I'll just say this is uh, Kathleen Liang from North Carolina A&T State University, and she is also the director of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. But way before that, she was at the University of Vermont, which is where I first got to know Kathleen. So Kathleen, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, Mary and I will go way back. <laughs> I, was, I was a faculty at the University of Vermont for eight years before I moved to North Carolina a and and I came to North Carolina in 2016, learned everything that's totally different from the New England and Northeast type of agricultural farming scenario. Today, I want to share with you some of the things I've learned from our farmers. Uh, North Carolina a and is the largest HBCU land-grant institution in the country. And we also have the largest agriculture college across all the HBCU. Our client base is primarily small scale farmers, minority farmers, including women veterans, people with a disability and uh, all kinds of um, uh, categories that are defined by USDA. Our primary service domain is underserved the communities and underrepresented the population. Now, the Center for Environmental Farming System is a three-way partnership. We're the only partnership in the country with a 26 years of history, with the two land-grant institutions, NC State, NC a &T, and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Customer Services. Now, the website domain is hosted by NC State. So don't get us confused, we're three entities. Now, today I wanna to share something with you about what I learned about the labor issues and the transition, some opportunities that COVID-19 actually created for small and limited resource farmers. Now that's to me and my tag mission, harvesting our specialty boards on our research farm. We have an organic certified research farm in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and I am a practicing farmer. The only thing I don't do is to drive the tractor. I do everything else on the farm. And uh, that was our success story in 2020 when people locked down. Our research farm was in full operation because we were actually cranking up food to give away to uh, the communities that need healthy food. Our farmer markets across the state were operating as normal throughout North Carolina, but uh, we have to change how we work with customers. As you can see, no more sampling. You don't get to eat the juicy food and the vegetables from North Carolina. You just have to trust the the quality, which we do. A quick overview about what happened uh, with COVID-19 that brought some issues, challenges, but also opportunities for different type of farmers since uh, last year. The CDC created a new guideline for farm worker health and a safety perspective 
the full scenario is available on the CDC guideline website and everybody can access that very easily. We use that to train our farmers who were still working with uh, uh, laborers. We have a very large population of guest labor workers. So those are immigrant workers. We call them guest workers on the farm. So this has been very important and very helpful for a lot of our farmers working in the southern region. Now, um, a lot of the news report talking about how farm laborers were not well protected and there seems to be some confusions and some issues across different areas. And that lack of labor support created the harvest issue, especially when the country went into lockdown in March. That was our first spring harvest season. I was already harvesting fruit and many of our farmers harvesting berries and the early vegetables. And many, many farmers had to um, destroy their crop because of labor issues. Now, American Bar Association also jumped in to talk about some legal perspective from COVID-19 impact on food and farm sector workers or from production safety, but this is about uh, the legal aspect. What exactly we need to do to protect these farm workers? Now, Wall Street Journal reported this April 27, the devastating situation that farmers have to destroy our crops. You know, the, it's not just about vegetable, dairy, beef, and a lot of the sectors were significantly influenced. The poetry, uh, especially in the southern region, we were um, in the very early beginning of a very wonderful season of production last year. But because of COVID-19, everything had to stop. NPR talked about the food supply chain being threatened because of COVID-19, a major issue relates to the labor perspective. It's not just about farm labor, including labor working in the processing, distribution, transportation, and all throughout the food supply chain. Different sectors, different businesses, they are all impacted by COVID-19. COVID-19 also created a lot of a, um, mental health challenges for farmers. The American Psychology Association, they have a special report talking about psychologists working with the farmers to understand and also to help finding solutions, getting the network, the system program to maintain the mental health beyond the physical strength. And now on the other side, the consumers are lacking food. This was um, in Texas, November 2020, but uh, you know things are still going on. We still have people do not have equitable access to healthy and safe food throughout the country, especially in the rural areas. And for many, many communities, we provide service too. I personally helped these communities and I've seen how devastating the situation is still going on right now. I was interviewed by a local newspaper talking about small farmers. Now, um, comparing with a large commercial farm, we actually see a business boom for a lot of the small local uh, farming operations. People were calling their neighbors like a crazy, trying to find what exactly they have available on their farm. And the community network suddenly became the best um, coalition just naturally formed to help local farmers. And uh, we interviewed over 25 small farmers over the time period that I can access them. And everybody was so busy filling out their orders and trying to get people uh, to what they need to buy. And it was just a, it's a very interesting contrast, but again, this also adds more stress to small farmers who usually don't hire labor to help. They rely on family members and all the kids jumping to help too. 
That's me and my farm manager. We harvested some of the very outstanding Asian vegetables during the COVID-19 time. And we donate all of our harvest to local soup kitchen. Uh, with only one season, uh, one and a half person running a 30 acre farm, we were able to harvest over 3,000 pounds of specialty vegetables and donate to local soup kitchen. So let's talk about how other farmers handle the new normal, and especially through transitioning from a hand tools to machinery during the time period. Now, a lot of farmers told me that oh, well, we don't hire people. <laughs> First of all, we can't afford it. You heard the reason already. But secondly, they really don't know where to find people to hire that they can trust. Uh, for small farmers, that's our research farm, by the way. Uh, we don't really use machinery too much because if you have one acre to three acres kind of operation one season at a time, that's about just a family of four can handle. And that's the kind of farmers I work with. Especially for beginning farmers and small farmers, they work with the family labor. However, they don't compensate family labor. So there are sometimes family feud, and uh, sometimes there's uh, just some argument or unnecessary issues that could occur, become conflict within family members. Now, something prevents small and the beginning farmers, particularly working with the machinery perspective, is the scale and the mixed configuration about what they grow. We grow mixed vegetables, 20 to 35 different varieties of specialty Asian vegetables, um, about three acre plus. But we uh, start half of acre at a time. You can see we use the plastic mulch and uh, underneath is the drip irrigation that are laid down there. Now you want to guess who the hole puncher is? You're listening to it. I am the hand labor when during the COVID-19 when we, we don't have any student intern or whatever. I punch the thousands of holes through the plastic one at a time. And uh, that's uh, how we operate. But it really didn't take me too long. So um, I had to train my part-time technician to help me to do the transplant kind of stuff. The challenge is if we want to get people to transition to machinery to reduce the time and effort, it's really challenging to find the equitable, adequate, not just equitable, the adequate machine that can do the work given the special scale and the configuration design. Small and the beginning farmers, they don't have much money in the investment aspect. So they all start very small with a handful. Um, most likely with a walking behind the killer. A BCS, small, uh, semi, kind of a killer uh, kind of a system could easily cost them about $8,000 to $20,000, depends on the type of design and the attachments you want to buy with it. So not a lot of people that we work with could afford it. Very often, hand tools are actually more efficient than the machinery because you got to fool around with the equipment, figure out what to do with it. If it breaks down, you have to figure out how to fix it. And then who can fix it in a rural area? There's really not an easy way to solve the problem. It's probably easy to use a hole and the shovel to handle the situation as we need it. Now, that's not a long-term solution though. For these small farmers and uh, beginning farmers, eventually their goal is to become self-sustainable that's uh, uh, good enough to maintain a viable business. So you talk about labor, the opportunities for the labor training comes in when farmers are ready to scale up and to take it into the higher technology aspect. A lot of young people will be attracted to farming operation if we let them know they're high tech, such as artificial intelligence and uh, automatic robotic operation that we could help farmers to identify the innovative methods 
that take the farming to the next level into a new century, many, many young people will be interested in uh, coming back to agriculture. It's the challenge is the issue when you show them the shovel and the, the soil, and then you say you have to bend down to pull the weeds, and they just look at you with a big eyes. It seems very naive. They say, you really, you mean that you want me to bend down there to touch the soil to pull the weeds? I say, yeah, do you have another way to do it? So um, it's a different generation with a different kind of thinking, but there are ways we can uh, incentivize young people to participate. Now for COVID-19, people moved on to a different mindset of interacting with the farmers. This is our state operated the farmer's market rally. Farmer market is one of the largest in the country. It's also one of the best most well managed by the state government in the country. Uh, you can see the scale definitely changed the significance. Before COVID-19, it's a just a pack. Person to person, you can barely walk in there. But with COVID-19, we have to make sure we follow the CDC guidelines. This is our fruit harvest. And then also our state offers uh, farmer market nutrition program by accepting all kinds of coupons, EBT, and all kinds of a, a discount program that we joined the effort to support senior people or minority people or people with no question asked. Anybody show up, you need the help, uh, we will help you to access uh, nutritious and uh, healthy food. Our Muscadam grape was one of the best sellers in the country. When people move to online, this is where I encourage young people to become involved in farming because the farmers, a lot of farmers move to online platforms. So you don't have to work in the field if you don't want to. There are other ways we could bring young people back to the farming sector and contribute on different aspects. Marketing is an example. There are all kinds of online platforms that people can participate, whether it's a private or a public or hybrid models. There are all kinds of opportunities uh, for young people to participate. Uh, online platforms could be complicated. Engineers can help. Computer science people can help. Communication science people can help. We're teaching these uh, courses in our College of Agriculture, including big data and the design configuration of online platforms to make sure that our students have the proper skills and the knowledge to start the job market with the farmers in all aspects. Online is not the best way sometimes, it depends on personality, depends on your profile, what you're selling, how much you have to sell, and so on and so forth. This is just for everybody's information. Uh, not Online market is not one size to fit all. It's definitely not for everybody. One of the most successful online um, domain platform is the National Market Maker Program. Some of you probably heard about it, and you can just Google National Market Maker Program. This is an example that Virginia Market Maker launched in 2015, and a whole national market maker um, program domain tripled their traffic since the COVID-19. They have over a million subscribers with uh, farmers, service providers, buyers, and so on and so forth. Farmers can sign up for free. There is no fee, no charge for any farmer to participate in this program. We work with the, um, the mic worker program I mentioned to you, so I want to share this information with you. Avencio is a good friend of mine, and he is the executive director of the largest association of Mexican migrant worker program in the country. His organization organized a weekly report with the government agencies, with the hospital workers, with the school teachers, and I serve on their board. They have a huge network um, in North Carolina and the beyond to help um, um, the population that is in the migrant worker program. So please feel free to reach out to Havencio and just let him know that I introduced you to him. 
he'll be very happy to share all the information with you. Finally, this is our contact information for you. On our website, there are much more information, all the programs we have for farm labor and to support new beginning farms and small farms, veteran farm programs, people with disability farming activities and children's STEM program, all kinds of stuff. Um, all in all, we are all doing this together. I'm very happy that Mary had had the time for me, uh, 15 minutes or so for me to share what I have learned since I moved to North Carolina. Uh, it's just a blessing for me to explore a different part of the country that I had never learned before. And I'm also very fortunate to have all these networks, these people supporting our work. And I look forward to interacting with you. Uh, that's it, Mary. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. So we have a few minutes for some questions. And then I also just want to um, remind folks that have been here before and introduce uh, to folks who are, are new today that uh, one of the goals for this session is um, to, to sort of see if there's any interest in creating a community of practice or a learning network around um, farm labor issues. So if you're interested and you haven't already done so, go ahead and drop your um, email into the chat and we'll um, we'll stay in touch. And I don't exactly know how it's going to work out because that part hasn't been written yet. But um, I do know that there's a lot of us around the country that have been interested in this. I know that farmers, as I said, are extremely interested. Um, and I feel like uh, it's we're better together. So in terms of uh, from a synergy perspective, it's probably better if we, um, you know, try to try to deal with some of these very complicated and complex issues uh, together rather than each doing our own thing. Um, so anyway, having said that, I'm not seeing um, any questions, but you're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask any of our presenters today anything that juice is on your mind. And um, Beth, is did you want to say something about set, fo a follow-up email or something while we're? Sure. Um, so we'll be following up with um, an email to everyone who pre-registered for the series, um, where we'll share links to the recordings and the slides um, as we have them, and um, resources and information that was shared in the chat. Um, for example, I noticed today Jennifer shared a link to the report on the 2020 um, focus groups that they did. Um, so we'll compile all that and make it easy for you to um, find it and go more in depth if you want to. Okay. And I'm still not seeing any questions pop up, but again, I'll just invite anybody who has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. And we'll just be quiet for a minute. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jennifer, for updating us. Um, the SARE project has been really fun for me. <laughs> Kathleen, what was the melon you were holding? That's the question. <laughs> oh, I was hoping somebody would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a melon. It's a gourd. It was a gourd. Wait, wait, oh. Just a second. I'll go back. I'll go back to that picture. If I can find that picture. Where was that picture? Near the well, end. Was near the end? Yeah. No, I think it's near the middle. 
Well, anyway, while I was looking for it, it's an Asian special gourd. It's called a fuzzy gourd. I can't say it anymore. Wow. That's me and then my specialty squash. It's a fuzzy gourd that, um, it's a, oh, this one. There you it's go. Like a, yeah. It's a winter variety and it's a fuzzy on the skin. And you probably saw in the Asian market in the Northeast, we have a lot of farmers here in Vermont, uh, New Hampshire growing them. A winter melon, they call it a winter melon. But it's actually not a melon, it's in the gourd category. And the one I was holding is about eight pounds. And the one in front of a willer is between five pounds to eight pounds. And that it's a, you, you eat it like a cucumber, basically. You can eat it like a salad or you can cook it. I put it in the soup. But it's a medicine. Everything we grow on our research farm has a medicine, medicinal purpose and a, fruit vegetable compound that will fight chronic disease. We have all this information on our website and uh, all of our training material uh, also in dual language. We have Spanish version and then we have English version. So feel free to check it out on our website. All right. I'm teaching, I'm teaching people in North Carolina and the Southern region to grow these kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, too. A lot of our farmers uh, grow winter melon and we have some recipes on our website as well. There's a delicious winter melon soup recipe and yeah, we, we always, always try to encourage our CSA members to try something new and unusual. Well, so, there you go. I was going to ask a question. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I'm wondering if um, anyone else on this uh, in this meeting has seen any other kind of innovative labor models in their region or in their work that we could learn about. So one of the things that we did as a, as a group of service providers through this project is we invited um, a program from Colorado to come speak to us. They were doing something similar to this with veterans. And then we also had a presentation by OSHA just about some of the other changes due to COVID and other things. So I'm just wondering if, if anyone here has anything to offer. Uh, I think uh, we look at our SARE project as a learning community among the service providers as well a little bit. So you are doing, know of any farmers that are already sort of self-organizing or forming kind of informal labor pools. We'd love to learn more about those models to kind of continue to explore the models that we're developing. Hi, this is Liz Henderson. A few years ago, there was a group of young would-be farmers who organized themselves. They were in Massachusetts as a labor supply. And they, the first year they all lived in a house together and then they became a little less communal, but I don't know what happened with their experiment, whether they're still doing it and whether they considered it a success, but they hired themselves out to farmers. They did a lot of weeding. Hmm. And um, I will also just say, Jennifer, that uh, either yesterday or the day before, there were a couple of things shared with us that as Beth said, we'll we'll try to sort of collect all of this information and share it about because not everybody was able to be with us for all three days. So, um, and and there are other projects too that we were not able to get scheduled in these three days. So we may do a second round of uh, more, even more labor innovative programming and research that's going on um, just as a way of keeping everybody kind of up to speed and, you know, at the at the top of our game. So I see that we're just about out of time. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up, but I do want to thank everybody for participating, both our speakers and um, our participants who gave their time. And um, I know sitting, I know we've all spent way too much time on Zoom. So um, I appreciate you hanging in there. I, I just have one last comment, yeah. if you don't mind. No, not at all. I've been working on like a career. Oops, you just muted yourself, Elizabeth. There you go. Policies that are not only legal, but are also fair. And I did a first run with the uh, incubator farm, the regenerator at Pie Ranch. And that first time was a little raggedy because 
of technical problems. They, all the young farmers were in a barn and I was on Zoom. So we couldn't really hear one another very well. But the curriculum is coming together and I just wanted you all to know about it um, because it will be available. And what I'd like to do is make it available to people who are trainers to use themselves when you're training new farmers or existing farmers on how to go beyond what's legal to what's fair in terms of labor policies. Great. Super. I might follow up with you on that. Um, Please do. Okay. Well, we are at the top of the hour and um, Rachel is had to check out, but thank you again, everybody. And Beth, I think you can go ahead and turn the recording off.